this is an encouragement for those of us who know our God is an individual, and that individual is Jesus Christ, who came here himself to rescue us. And I want to speak on the subject of glory because they will bring up the subject of glory. That is the people who believe God is more than one person. They'll say, see, he said, the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world and things like that. And say, see, there you go. Proof of two people. But that's not what he's saying. And I want to illustrate this. So, in Isaiah 48, 11 and 12, the Lord is speaking. He, he, there's, let's look at the way he speaks. He says, for my own sake. For my own sake. He repeats it. He is emphasizing it's for his sake. And yes, it's for my own sake. This is a very emphatic statement he is making here about who he is. I will do it. He says, for my sake, I will do it. He addressed what he's doing in the verse previous, but I want to focus on his person here. For how should my name be profaned? You see that? His name is profaned if you don't acknowledge him for who he is. It is a pro it profanes his name to suggest that he is more than one person. And by the way, if you're watching this as a short, click on the link that's right about here so you can see the whole thing. This is not a very long video. I'm just telling it to people who are seeing this as a short, which is usually a lot more people. So he's saying that to profane his name is to suggest that his name is other names. In other words, more than one person. The notion of God being more than one person profanes him. And I will not give my glory to another. This is a statement. He, he makes statements like this all over the Old Testament. And that did not change in the New. If it did, that would have been the greatest revelation of all time. As I have said in many videos, it would have been articulated in a very specific and, and strictly explicit manner. Hey, look, everyone, I am someone else. I am not the one who's talking to you all those thousands of years. I am God, too. But I'm this other God. This has been the greatest revelation of all time, in other words, especially to the Jewish people who only knew their God as one person. So he says this, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. That is whatever he does. He does whatever he does for his own sake first. For how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. So he bookends that question, for how should I bookend, for, for how should I profane my name? By, by identifying himself as the only one, and he will not share, he will not give his glory to another. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Now that's an expression of God's individuality passionately. He wants to be known for who he is, and he can be known for who he is. You cannot know someone who is some three, who is a collective, who is a committee. Now, in John 3.36, John the Baptist says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Now, how could you have everlasting life through another person that no one ever knew about? You never could have life before Jesus came? Well, he is making it clear that to believe in the Son is to believe in God himself. The Son is the one true God manifested in the flesh. And then going to John 14, 13, the Lord himself says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Now the focus here, the emphasis is on whatever in my name. What does his name mean? His name means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves, God saves. God has become salvation. There's different ways of saying it. But you, when you ask in that name, in, in the understanding that your God is your Savior, you can only ask things that He is willing to do. Because God is my Savior does not mean God is my religion. God is my rudiment of the world. God is my tradition of men. God is my denomination. It doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean God is my carnal desires. It means God is my Savior. So I can ask those things. And what do you ask in that context? Because all those other things I just mentioned are all going away. Your religion, your passions, your desires, all that stuff is going away. But what is going to remain is the Savior and those he saved. So what do you ask in that context? 
in the spirit of God being your Savior and no other. God, show me who you are. That's what Moses got the revelation of. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Not y'all's glory. Show me your glory. And he showed us his glory. He showed us his glory in many, many ways. And the greatest way he showed it was when he came here as that man. So that's what it is to ask anything in his name. You want to know who he is. You want to understand who he is and what he's done. So that, that you can see how that changes you. He doesn't need to do anything. I'm not saying he doesn't do anything. He does uh, do divine intervention. He does do that, but it's on his terms, on his choice, when he wants to. But he always responds to someone who asks for understanding. James said this in chapter 1 of James. Anyone who asks for understanding will get it. That is what you can handle, what you can bear right now. But if you ask for that, that's what he will give. So, he says this, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's not two glories, there's not two people being glorified. The Father is glorified in the Son because the Son shows who the Father is and what the Father does. That's why he says, my Father has been working till now, and I have been working. It wasn't two people working. He was simply saying, I'm the same one. My Father's been working, so have I. It's not we have both been working. He's telling us he's the Father. That's in John 5, 17 or 18, by the way, if you want to look that up. It's not a statement of two people doing the same thing or two different things or any of that. It's one person doing it. It's just that one person happened to manifest as our Savior in the flesh because a man had to save us. So that's why he did that. God could not just decree from on high, all men are saved. That something actually had to be done and a man had to do it. So he became that man. So just to finish it up there on the glory, why it is glorious that the Son does these things and Philippians 2.11, he says, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How could it be to the glory of this person that this other person is the Lord? It's not. It's to the glory of God the Father because the Father is the Lord. And the Lord came here as the man Christ Jesus. That is glorious. That is a glorious truth that he did not just sit on high listening holy, holy, holy from his angels. But he, he departed from there, and he became a little lower than the angels, and he submitted himself to, to the life of a servant, and even to the death, the death of the cross, for you, for me, for everyone, even those who would reject him to their death. That is glorious. That is why it is glorious. And that is why it is the glory of one person, one person who can do more than one thing at one time, and one person who is willing to manifest himself as a human person, he became something he isn't to show us who he really is. Even though he knows people would lie about him, diminish him, divide him, and really degrade him by suggesting that he is more than one person. It wasn't another person. The no greater love is God himself gave himself for his friends. And you are his friend if you believe in that one and only God, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.